Friends, let us pray. Gracious, loving, and merciful God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. I knew we were going to have a small crowd, and I am certainly not surprised that it is especially small after the week we've had. Um, I do have a sermon. I will preach that sermon, and then at our announcements, I'd like to just have some time to talk a little bit about the week. So, um, The opening colic is what really caught my attention as I was preparing this. I was struck with the choice of some words and phrases like graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, and bring forth in us fruits of good works. Those words and the readings of this morning, along with the experiences of this past week with Hurricane Adalia, and the difficulties of when nature lashes out in such violent ways, gave me a lot to think about. We've seen in this past week the destructive power of wind and water. We've had plenty of examples recently in our scriptures of the way water and wind tosses boats about on the Sea of Galilee. Peter starts to drown when he feels the wind blowing against him as he's standing on water. In our Exodus reading from today, we have another natural phenomenon, fire, which also wreaks havoc and causes destruction. Think of the images that you might have seen on television of Lahaina and Maui with charred vehicles in the ashen ruins of what used to be a paradise. Some of us know the frightening experiences of escaping fire from our homes. Most of us, I'm sure, remember September 11th, almost 22 years ago, when the heat from two crashed passenger airplanes melted the steel and caused the World Trade Center to collapse. Fire is extremely devastating. But here in Exodus, we actually see a different image of fire. The bush was blazing, but not consumed. A fire is raging, and yet the bush itself isn't burning up. And yet it is. It's a fiery passion. What Moses sees and hears coming from the bush is a fire that's lit up for justice, one that has seen and heard enough from the Israelites. I have observed the misery of my people. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. I have come to deliver them. This is a God on fire for making things right that are going wrong for God's people. We can hear that same passion when we listen to the exchange in the gospel between Jesus and Peter. Jesus tells the disciples what's in store for him as he marches on toward Jerusalem, and Peter takes him aside to tell Jesus to stop talking that way. Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Jesus is hot. He knows what his mission is. He knows what he's, that he's walking into a dangerous situation. And he knows that Peter simply doesn't understand. Peter may be the rock, but he hasn't grasped yet that to challenge the status quo and to push back against empire, tyrants, and bullies, it's going to involve pain and suffering. Because Jesus is charting a different way of responding to the evil of his society, evil that frankly still exists around us today. Jesus isn't leading a revolution that is about burning things down to the ground. His is a revolution that sets aflame the hearts of those who speak words of love in the face of hatred, keeps the faith against all odds and doesn't let the fire within 
consume us with the rage that tips us over into becoming the very bully and tyrant being challenged to change. Jesus is showing the disciples, both those that were with him then and those of, them, of us who are still following him some 2,000 years later, that we must stick close to the source of love and life and let that be the energy, the fire that burns within us. It's that source which, to go back to the colic, nourishes us with all goodness. We learn from Jesus. We see how he interacts with those in need, as well as the way he interacts with those in positions of power. We don't just admire Jesus. We attempt to live our lives in such a way that people see Jesus in us, through us, and around us. This is the Jesus who shows hospitality to strangers and doesn't believe in payback when someone does you wrong. This Jesus demands that we back away from the temptation of self-centeredness and self-reliance and accept that God will show up in the form of others offering help and putting us on a path of repentance, love, forgiveness, and mercy. That's the true religion we want to increase. Marion Hatchett, who was the chair of the commission which created our 1979 Book of Common Prayer, wrote in his commentary on the prayer book that the phrase true religion came from Thomas Cranmer, the author of the first Book of Common Prayer. And it may have been written as a reflection on the controversies that were occurring with the church back in the 16th century. <coughs> a true religion is what Paul is encouraging among the followers in Rome, and is great advice for us in these times of such political conflicts and short tempers. To be a follower of Jesus is to be different than what has become the accepted norm of hurling insults or settling arguments by picking up a pistol. To be true to Jesus means having that flaming bush for justice burning within us, advocating and encouraging cooler heads to prevail in tense situations, and remembering that the person we are having a conflict with is also one of God's beloved children. When we put all of that into action, the grafting of God's name, that sacred name of I am who I am, will shine through us like a neon light flashing in a storefront window. Difficult, sad, and exhausting as it is to go through a hurricane, it's in these times when we are at the mercy of nature and big trucks and linemen that our Christianity is called upon to show up. Because Christianity is a communal religion. And that's been happening. Neighbors have been checking in on neighbors with offers of food and shelter. Those with generators have been giving respite to those who needed a place to cool off. Restaurants serving up hot dogs and hamburgers as a way of giving back to the community that kept their doors open during the challenging times of the pandemic. These are all the signs of God's fiery work in us and through us as community. So many of you that I spoke to this past week were talking about how you tapped into your faith during the storm. And that faith gave you thankfulness that you made it through alive. The most consistent message I heard from people was, we'll get through this. And yes, we will. Because God does hear the call of God's people and responds. And thanks be to God for that. In the name of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.